All right, and I have uh, 12 o'clock sharp Eastern Standard Time. So we will go ahead and get started with our um, 988 jam session, or as um, the late great Don Cornelius would refer to as the hippest trip in America. So we welcome everyone back. Um, do want to uh, just take a minute to, to recognize um, some, some of the things that are, are I'm sure, front of mind to a lot of Oh, and by the way, I am Vic Armstrong, and I am your host for today. It is my pleasure to be here with you. Um, I do want to just take a minute, remind everyone, just be mindful of um, so much that is going on around us right now with, as we remember um, uh, 9-11 and our, our thoughts and prayers are with families and, and, and the families of folks who uh, lost folks at 9-11, the first responders who responded during 9-11 and so many of their families that have been impacted and just the memory of what happened that day. So I want folks to be uh, mindful of that. Also to be mindful that uh, this is um, uh, National Suicide Awareness uh, Month. And so we want folks to, to also be uh, mindful of that. And, and then also um, to all of those that have been impacted by Hurricane Ida. Uh, we want to keep that in mind as well because we, we realize that so many people uh, that we know and care about um, have been in the path of this storm. And so we, we absolutely want to be mindful of, uh, of, uh, of the impact um, of Hurricane Ida. So again, thank you to everyone for being with us today and we will um, go ahead and move along with our program. And I believe, uh, next slide, Karen, I believe our, uh, we will go to Margie's, uh, Margie's um, crisis meme. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> so I was thinking since we've got less than a year until we have 988 and today is 98, that maybe we should make a social media push to get the word out because I've been surprised by how many people don't know about it. Um, I guess, you know, I live this stuff, so I sort of assume everyone knows about it, but um, even people who are kind of in the mental health field don't, don't know about it. So I've been sharing these memes that are on the Crisis Now website. So, and I'm gonna put them all on my um, Twitter as soon as we get off this call, which is M.E. Balfour. So share some crisis memes and get the word out. Absolutely. Thank you for that. You know, it, it's also, uh, it also strikes me, Margie, that there are folks who, uh, even the folks that are aware that 988 um, exists are not aware of the opportunity that it presents for us to really, really rethink and re reimagine our, our crisis services. So, um, so thank you for that reminder. And thank you also for, for giving a meme that was not a Star Wars meme. I never understand Star Wars. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio, I can do. Thank you. All right, our um, just recognizing that we are growing in terms of uh, the work that's happening around the country. Uh, as we're moving toward 988, we have um, 50 states, all 50 states that are participating, and we have 10 states that um, have included their 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 Medicaid uh, programs. And so we want to encourage folks to continue to to do that to. Uh, continue to uh, involve your Medicaid folks and invite them to this crisis jam. Let them know all the fun that they are missing. And we would love to have them on, um, on, on this, this call. Um, this is one of the calls that I always look forward to because there is such a breadth and depth of knowledge on this call. Um, as we think about all the folks that are change agents, innovators that are on this call, talking about everything from policy lived experience. And I think this is where um, a lot of the conversation takes place about the, the what if. What if we think about things differently? What if we do things differently? What could we create um, for folks who are experiencing uh, mental health crisis? So, um, so again, uh, we encourage um, folks to, to join us for this call. Next slide, please. And just want to remind folks too how easy it is to get up to speed on everything that's going on with our 988 Crisis Jam. Uh, you see here the Zoom link. You have access to all the past videos um, that, that have been shared on the Crisis Jam. You can download materials. Um, the quotes, I have used them from time to time when I'm doing some public speaking to just pull up the quote and, and use that in the background. Uh, so it's been made extremely easy for us. And again, uh, we just want to continue folks to uh, want to encourage folks to continue to invite um, folks to come and join us on this on this call. 
uh, let them know that it is not just um, an, an information sharing um, opportunity, but it's also a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun on this call uh, while we're learning. So again, uh, we do encourage you to, to invite folks. Next slide, Karen. And then uh, our quote of the day, law enforcement shouldn't be on the scene of a mental health crisis unless there's a clear logical reason to have the presence of an armed public servant. That's a quote from Dr. John Franklin Sierra and how true that quote is. And um, you know, for me, it, it always reminds me of uh, the, the, the why and the opportunity that's presented by 988. It's not just um, a three-digit number, but it is a way for us to, 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 again, think differently about how we respond to people who are experiencing mental health emergencies. And um, just a reminder that um, there is a purpose, there's a time and a place and a purpose for law enforcement. And when someone's experiencing a mental health emergency, um, our first priority should be to respond to that emergency with mental health professionals and with folks who can speak to that mental health emergency that they're experiencing. Uh, there, will be, there will be occasions where it may be appropriate to have a law enforcement presence, but uh, law enforcement should never be the first priority for individuals who are experiencing mental health crisis. And that also frees our law enforcement brethren up to do um, the things that they are trained to do and the things that we need them to be doing in terms of protecting and serving. Next slide. So this brings us to our crisis talk article. So I will turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so this week I chatted with Rebecca Boss. She's a senior consultant at the Treatment Advocacy Center, and she's also the former head of Rhode Island's Department of Behavioral Healthcare, Developmental Disabilities and Hospitals. Um, and what she talked about, what she shared with me, is that a crisis response may be the first and only chance to help a person experiencing a substance use disorder. Um, and she says, not only to affect the immediate outcome uh, of the crisis, but also a person's overall recovery process. She shared with me that the emergency response for substance use disorders has long been segregated from mental health, the overall treatment system and its development. And so she says with 988, there's really an opportunity to create parity um, and to create a system that is equal regardless of diagnosis. Um, if, I don't know if Rebecca's on the line. Karen, do you know if she was able to get on? I am. Oh, great. Yeah. So, <laughs> So can you share a little bit about both how vital a crisis response is for a person who's experiencing a substance use disorder and also what leaders need to think about as they build out and redesign their crisis systems in anticipation of 988? Well, thank you for inviting me on the call, first of all, and for having this important subject be present. Um, I noticed on the slide that was before this, as well as the meme, that the information was specific to mental health and it didn't cite substance use disorder um, or the or more broad category of behavioral health that we're used to. And so I wonder sometimes if people will silo their thinking around crisis response to mental health specific diagnoses, not including the opportunity for a crisis response to, to address someone whose needs are more focused on substance use disorders. Um, and we look at the importance of addressing substance use in crisis um, as a way to engage people, to screen people, to know what their needs are at the time of crisis and to get them connected to the right level of service. And that is the opportunity. And with the overdose crisis escalating across the nation still and not having been resolved, we look at opportunities of crisis intervention as an entry point for an individual whose next use may very well be their last use. And this is a, a really um, critical opportunity to engage someone. And if we can provide them with the right kind of support and the right kind of engagement and the right level of connection to a service that's needed, it may very well be the life-saving opportunity that is, is going to be life-changing for them. I uh, recently, there was a, 
program in, in Rhode Island that we initiated, which was having peers respond to in overdose survivors in emergency rooms. It's been replicated across the country. There are a lot of places that are using this approach now, but you're using someone with lived experience and an opportunity to engage someone who has just suffered um, or been through a significant crisis and identify with them, share their lived experience, provide the opportunity for hope we saw a lot of improvement and connection for those individuals and having people who had been um, overdose survivors themselves then go on to become peers. I saw a recent post from a young woman in Rhode Island who, um, who had a long history of substance use disorder, incarceration, homelessness, um, and had overdosed, which she said was 21 times. And that individual um, is now working, having graduated with a bachelor's degree on her, her master's level program. Um, and she's working as a peer recovery specialist in emergency rooms, responding to individuals who have survived overdoses and overheard a first responder talk about administering Narcan to the individual that she was there to see a number of times um, and having seen them come to the emergency room a number of times. And you know, wondering, you know, what is what is it going to take? Um, she took that opportunity to introduce herself to the first responder and talk to him about her having been revived from overdose 21 times. And here she was, and and she was here to respond. And I think really took the first responder by surprise, and he couldn't believe that she was somebody who had lived through that kind of experience. And for our field, it was, a, it was a voice and face of recovery that somebody was able to see when what they saw was the individual in crisis time and time again, mm -hmm. and gave them a new perspective of the opportunity to intervene in a crisis and to present perhaps a different kind of approach to individuals when they have overdosed or when they're in need or when they're in crisis and the families reached out. The importance for, I, I think, in terms of 988 is knowing how to engage, how to assess and how to connect individuals to levels of care that are needed. Uh, I had the opportunity through NASHBID to write a paper with the Technical Assistance Collaborative um, regarding uh, crisis response for individuals with substance use disorders and looking at um, how to engage individuals, how to um, approach them in terms of real-time access to care, how to uh, look at our screening and assessment instruments to know what their appropriate level of care is. Um, and with the opportunity for 988, we can bring that presence to using um, 988 to address the needs of individuals with substance use disorders in that crisis response, make sure that we're getting the right people involved, we're asking the right questions, we're making the right connections. Um, and I, I just really can't emphasize the importance of the presence in crisis response for individuals with substance use disorders. A positive experience, even if the outcome immediately is not one that um, puts them on a path to recovery, will impact future interactions in ways that they have an expectation um, that they will be received in a non-judgmental approach and that they will be given connections to care that can be helpful as opposed to um, connections of care that may not be appropriate for what their needs are. So to me, that's the importance of talking about substance use disorders when we're talking about crisis, when we're talking about 988 and moving forward in states. And Rebecca, that program that you were talking about is the Anchor ED program, is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Vic, would you like me to ask a couple more questions or what, or do you have- No, I didn't know if you had things. I do want to say, I think this is, yeah. this, is this is really such an, um, an important topic. And, and a couple of things that, that really just kind of jumped out at me. One is, because um, I think one, you know, the word parity was mentioned. And I think that's one mm -hmm. of the things that we don't talk about as we are talking about 988. And, um, you know, how, how do we also use 988 um, and the opportunity 988 pre uh, presents uh, to really push for more parity, parity in uh, in our in our uh, services service array and our response to services. So I think that is huge. The other thing, you know, I I think that we do oftentimes um, leave the the substance use disorder 
piece out of the conversation as we're talking about 988, we do think more about uh, mental health, uh, purely mental health emergencies. But the opportunity here, uh, as I see it, as for the substance use issues, is that we have over time kind of built this, you know, almost an unholy alliance between the justice system and substance use to where the majority of the folks that are referred for uh, substance use treatment actually enter through justice involvement. And in many ways, I think that hinders people from seeking help um, be because of the, the punitive nature of uh, what often follows. So I think as we're thinking about with 988, how do we incorporate into our response, a response that's sensitive to the needs of people who are um, living with substance use disorder, um, and making sure that they're getting the right assessments, making sure they're getting referred to the right resources is another huge opportunity, uh, not just to change the process, but to change the culture of how we respond to people. So. And Rebecca, you did that with, you know, B, I think it was BH Link, this, the no wrong door approach. And, you know, you talked to me a little bit about how there had to be a shift. Um, and initially the emphasis was on mental health and and how, could you talk a little bit about how you actually were able to build that out and create that shift that we need to see on the global sense with 988, um, how you have, how, how that happened with BH Link? Right, that's what I was thinking when Vic was, was speaking about mm -hmm. how can we incorporate substance use disorders in, and we look at the crisis response system and one of those important um, pieces is the, uh, alternatives to emergency departments, right? So, so places where people can go uh, for crisis triage, for the ability of 24 seven um, setting, that's not an emergency room where that can be part of the response when individual is in crisis and being able to be assessed appropriately. Um, there are a number of um, such programs around the country. What we did in Rhode Island was create uh, the BH Link program to be a 24-7 uh, facility where people could walk in or be transported by emergency or by the criminal justice system where police could bring people who were in crisis that would accept them and be able to see them regardless of diagnosis. And despite intent that it was regardless of diagnosis, it did start out being more mental health focused and taking individuals who were presenting um, with a psychiatric diagnosis who were in crisis. It took some work. And what we did was we engaged a um, community-based substance use treatment provider specifically to co-locate at the VH link to assist in the development of appropriate screening and assessment tools for substance use disorders and be able to do induction on medications, especially for opioid use disorder, but also for alcohol use disorder at the site um, and being able to be responsive to individuals' needs at the time of crisis um, and providing that alternative to emergency room where individuals with substance use disorders, it's, it's either tends to be, and I know uh, same with mental health, was either the emergency room or a prison cell. Um, and neither of those uh, are often appropriate to address the needs of someone who is suffering uh, in the middle of a crisis with a substance use disorder, whether it's alcohol or opioids or methamphetamine. Um, having an alternative setting with skilled individuals who can do assessments, who are able to determine what the level of care needed is and what kind of care can be initiated within that setting right then and there um, is a really important intervention. And the skill of having um, a facility that can address both disorders or the combination of both disorders in a setting that is um, recovery focused is very important. Yeah, again, such so really important work. The, the, the other thing too that I, I would point out, um, I think it's also so important to the equity um, discussion as well. When we look at uh, the disproportionate um, amount of black and brown people who do end up incarcerated uh, for substance use issues uh, as compared to the actual number of black and brown people who use illicit drugs. Um, so again, I think anytime that we can get people to a more appropriate level of care without involving the justice system, um, you know, the, the, better, the better we're gonna serve equity as well. So, so again, thank you so much, such important work. Anything else, um, Stephanie or Rebecca, before we, before we move on? 
You know, I, I, you're talking about the criminal justice system, and I think that it's really important that we engage our partners in the criminal justice system and being educated around substance use disorders. As much work has been done to educate them around mental illness, we also need to focus on the substance use disorder side of the world. It gets a little complicated, you know, because, you know, illegal drugs are still illegal drugs, and they have a role in criminal justice to look at um, what they need to do. But I think we've come a long way in terms of getting our criminal justice partners to understand addiction as a disease and that an individual with an addiction can be treated in the health system as opposed to a criminal justice system. And uh, that it's, it's just really important to your point, um, the more we can partner with criminal justice and help them to understand their role can be one of encouragement and engaging individuals and getting them to a better place than um, arresting them uh, or charging them for having a disease. It's, it's something that we have to work on, I think, consistently and constantly. Progress has been made, but to your point, not enough. And clearly there's not an equitable response to that education in our communities. And more focus needs to be paid on that level of discrimination in communities around substance use disorders and addiction and how we respond to it. So you know, I really appreciate that point. And we certainly still have a lot of work to do, uh, but I think that it's a promising future if we can focus and work together on it um, as one. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much. Again, very, very important work. And, and Stephanie, just excellent job as always. Thank you. For Thank that. you. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna in the interest of time uh, we're gonna move on to our SAMHSA update. I believe mm -hmm. we have John Palmer with us for our SAMHSA update today. Uh, hi, hi John, good John Palmieri. I'm sorry. No, 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 no problem. Hi, good afternoon. Um, and I think Richard might be on the call as well, and I can I can pass it off to him. Uh, just a couple of quick. Uh, updates from SAMHSA. Uh, one, I think Dr. Everett reported last week that we were engaged in a uh, kind of pilot convening uh, with regions two and three uh, related to uh, sustainability and federal funding uh, around crisis services. And so we're synthesizing uh, some of the learning and next steps from that meeting to really think about next steps uh, and recognizing that there's a really strong desire for guidance in the field uh, on sustainable funding solutions. So that's one thing I wanted to report out on. Uh, we are also enhancing our focus on operational readiness for the Lifeline call centers, uh, really trying to drill down on uh, kind of where they are currently in terms of benchmarks and where we need to get to, uh, you know, as of July of 2022 and beyond. Uh, so really um, getting deeper into the weeds on um, specific outcomes uh, and benchmarks for progress uh, and performance of the system. Um, the other thing quickly is that we are working with NASHPA. This is also related to kind of operational readiness uh, and implementation, working with NASHPA to create a set of technical papers uh, that are largely focused on aspects of 988. Um, and as soon as we have um, sort of finalized the content uh, of those, they'll be communicated uh, to, to this audience. Um, and then uh, just as an update that I know that was reported on last week, the reports to Congress, which I know people are interested in and ask frequently about, those are in various stages of clearance and clearance process. And so we'll continue to provide updates uh, as we get them. And I think that's I think that's it for me. Thank you so much. John, real quick, do, do you have any sense of um, where states are in terms of operational readiness for the for the lifeline itself? Uh, we have some information on that. So one thing that we look at is, you know, in-state response rates, um, which is uh, something that actually is publicly available data. Um, uh, and so that is, that is something that we're looking at. We're also collecting lots of information from the states through the planning grant process with Vibrant, um, getting, uh, providing some technical assistance and getting information from the states through our block grant uh, process as well. So we're collecting both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, but it's definitely something that, and there's it's huge variability, as you could imagine, uh, state to state in terms of where, where states are with respect to their ability to respond to contacts within state, uh, their reliance on the backup network, um, 
funding uh, that's dedicated or allocated at the state level to 988. There's a huge level of variability there. So, but that is something that we're continually tracking and really, you know, making sure that we're identifying opportunities for federal state partnership and engagement to really kind of move the system along. Great, thank you. I, I cannot um, overstate uh, how helpful the technical assistance is from Vibrant. I know in North Carolina, it has been extremely helpful uh, for us, um, just in terms of um, the guidelines, the metrics, helping us know where we are in the process, being able to gauge our progress and, and look at where we where we have left to go um, as opposed to where we are now. So, so again, um, just just thank you so much to, to both SAMHSA and Vibrant for all the support. And uh, thank you, John. Sure. All right, and we will now move to our NASPIT update. Uh, Megan. Megan, you're on mute if you're talking. Megan, okay. All right, do we need to come back to Megan? Let's see if we can come, can we come back to Megan and maybe move ahead to our um, national legislative update? Hi, uh, this is Sarah Corcoran. Hey, Sarah. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you so much. And I will try to be quick, but it has kicked off to a busy September here in DC. Uh, the committees are working on that $3.5 trillion infrastructure package. The budget resolution, which is the first real step of that, did pass both chambers in August. Uh, so now the different committees of jurisdiction are working on drafting their bills. Uh, we will be, be uh, beginning the markups for those bills on the House side this week into the next couple weeks. It looks like the Senate is probably not going to do a markup um, process, uh, but the House is going to, it seems like, use this process to have a little bit of negotiating leverage with the Senate, who really seems to be leading this reconciliation process. Uh, so once we start to see more language from the House, uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated, but that is not a a final benchmark of what is what it's going to look like. We're going to have to wait to see uh, what the House and Senate agree on. Uh, but that is that big infrastructure package that has a lot of our priorities in it. And then the second piece is on the appropriations front. Uh, we're expecting a possible Senate labor HHS markup potentially this month, uh, but we are coming up to the deadline of the uh, FY21 fiscal year. Um, that will be ending in the on the 30th of this month and beginning the new fiscal year on the 1st. We have not passed any spending bills into law as of now, so pretty much all of DC is preparing for a continuing resolution. Um, and we hope that CR will be signed into law before the end of the month so that we can keep the, the federal government open. But notably, uh, in the last thing, the Biden administration did release a list of special funding requests yesterday for the CR. And that does include a request that the lifeline to be funded at the FY22 House level, which is increased to 102 million instead of. Um, it's, I believe it's 78 million higher than the FY21 level. So it does show a really strong um, interest and dedication from the administration, SAMHSA, all the agencies that they request that they, uh, this funding be at that higher level, then continuing it at the FY21 level. So I'm happy to provide the link to that full document, but that's a, a great sign. Uh, we, we need that to be included in the CR and it passed and signed into law before the 30th, but that's the, the track that we're on so far in this very busy September. Excellent, thank you so much. If you do have the link that you could drop in the chat, that would be great. And I love the, the, the wave in the picture. I think that is um, spot on, thank you. Vic, um, I made it back on. My computer uh, completely locked up. It was the worst timing ever. <laughs> welcome back. All right, Megan. <laughs> Thank you. So Nashville is having our annual meeting starting tomorrow. It's September 9th and 10th, September 13th, 14th and 15th. And we're highlighting uh, the Nashville uh, and SAMHSA funded 2021 
beyond bed papers that really highlights 988 and crisis services and different aspects. So we're really excited about that. The agenda is completely based on those papers with some uh, additional issues, including workforce. Um, and so we're just very excited. And this crisis jam will be part of the annual meeting, September 15th. Um, of course, it'll remain the same uh, Zoom link for the crisis jam, uh, but we are very excited to fold that into our annual meeting. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Glad you made it back. Me too. All right, um, Natalie, did you have a, did you have an update from AFSP? Sure. Um, Sarah talked about reconciliation. So in this or the CR rather. So on that front, um, I don't have anything to add. But I know last week um, Richard McKean asked me for an update on the National Suicide Hotline um, Improvement Act. That is S two four two five. I do not actually have an update beyond that I'm still working on following up and hoping that um, we will receive more information on that legislation um, as a SAMHSA report comes out um, to be able to have that bill negotiated um, the rest of the way out of the Senate. Very good, thank you so much. And we will move right along into our state update. I believe Laura is giving us that state update. Hi, Vic. Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, SAMHSA, uh, NASHVID, uh, and the, the administration for including mm -hmm. Lifeline on um, the anomaly list. Uh, you know, would love to see, or, or you know, very grateful for the acknowledgement uh, that there will be needed uh, investment. And also, Vic wanted to just thank you uh, again for, for your great job hosting and also recognizing um, the work that is going on in the states through the planning grants. Uh, you know, the states are doing a lot, a lot, a lot of planning and very happy uh, that Vibrant is able to help facilitate those conversations. Um, I actually, there haven't been any new uh, legislative activity, but I did want to shift it to Jim Cooler. If he, I think he's on as well to talk about a California update. Uh, they had a large investment and if it's possible to just give him uh, some time to talk about that. Um, Thank you, Laura. Uh, it can be very quick. On Friday, the state of California made a $20 million commitment to help the 13 lifeline centers in California prepare for 988. So at this point, that is a one-time commitment to help ramp up and prepare our lifeline centers for the increased volume of calls and trying to weave that together with the other investments we're looking at and the larger picture around crisis mobilization services and crisis stabilization. So we are excited that uh, we were able to make an investment to support our, our lifeline centers in preparing. Fabulous. So thank you, Laura. Thank you. thank you, thank you for sharing that. Excellent. And I, I don't know if, I know Paul had to be on a plane um, I didn't know if there was anything uh, to share. Thirty seconds on the calculator. If not, we will we will certainly press ahead. Uh, did want to highlight, uh, and I, I believe Nevada might have been discussed last week. Not certain, but uh, but we did want to highlight Nevada um, on the great work that's going on there. Um, this is uh, you know th these to me are like those uh, tradable baseball cards. I think this is a. Uh, when the North Carolina one comes up, I'm definitely going to make that a keepsake. Uh, so thank you, Nevada. Special thanks to Senators uh, Raddy and, and uh, Keith Effer uh, for the work that they're doing on sponsoring legislation. Uh, so kudos to Nevada. All right, as we move forward, I believe we are at the point of uh, our feature, featured presentation. Uh, and I believe Megan is going to come back with us to give our to, to introduce our presenter. I am, and I am um, deeply honored to be able to do that. Uh, Steve Hammerdinger is the uh, director of Deaf Services for the Department of Mental Health and uh, for the state of Alabama. Uh, he is a good friend of Nashbids. Uh, I've known Steve for over twenty years. He's written multiple papers, including. Uh, and been involved in multiple papers for NASHBID, including a paper on reducing seclusion and restraint for the deaf and hard of hearing communities. Um, and 
including emerging best practices on crisis services, which he wrote a few years ago. Neely Ezekiel from Nashbid um, has posted that paper in the chat. And so uh, just Steve is a national leader on deaf services. He has consulted with states. He is the go-to person. And um, we're just very grateful that you're on, Steve. Um, take it away. One moment, I want to get set up here, get my screen on. Can we spotlight Mr. Hammerdinger, please? Let me see here. Can the host uh, spotlight Mr. Hammerdinger? He's on spotlight. Okay, for some reason, I can't see him and see. try the uh, speaker view that might do it. This is the other interpreter. Also, if people that aren't presenting would turn off their cameras, that would help. Okay, ready to go. All right, so this is uh, interesting. You know, this is an example of how different the deaf world is from the hearing world and, and how we operate, how we think, and how we do things, okay? It, it is different. I want to thank um, Megan for that wonderful introduction. And I think it was a little exaggerated, but um, I'm very honored to be uh, asked to participate in this discussion. All right, and uh, a little bit of background on who I am. I am deaf and I was born with, as a profound deaf person. And um, when I really became deaf, it is a mystery, but we uh, found out though, when I entered school, they noticed that I was deaf there. And um, I'm a person living with uh, mental illness, okay? And I am trained as a counselor. Uh, first experience before the master's program, I worked as a dorm supervisor for uh, deaf children from the age of 12 to 15 in a school for the deaf. And I was involved in uh, deaf mental health care now really over 40 years, 30 of those years as a state director, first in uh, Missouri and then um, in Alabama. So that's who I am. How did I uh, get involved in mental, deaf mental health care? Well, it's actually more to the point for this discussion. How did I uh, become interested in the interchange between uh, as a clinician uh, clinicians and deaf people. Clinicians uh, are indiv individuals who don't sign, okay? And uh, I graduated from Gallaudet University in 1989. And um, first job was a family uh, children therapist in, in New Mexico. And I showed up uh, that week, maybe, maybe a few days, and uh, in, at the School for the Deaf in New Mexico, uh, they, they had a contract uh, school psych psychiatrist, psychologist who would come to the school. Uh, I showed up uh, same time the doctor was there. They called me over and um, I said, how can I help you? They said, well, we're frustrated with this one uh, deaf girl. She's 12 years old, having trouble with uh, reaching her. Uh, we, we can't get her to stabilize and we cannot figure out why that is. And I had just graduated as with my master's in counseling and I'm thinking, what do I know? So 
the, my, the ink hadn't even dried on my degree. So I did what every uh, therapist does when they're in shock. I asked to see the chart. And so I get the chart and I'm thumbing through it. And I notice something interesting uh, in the chart. <coughs> there uh, is mention of uh, two interpreters who show up when the psychiatrist comes. And in 1989, this was a very good practice for the time, actually. There were actual sign language interpreters there. And, but I noticed that the two interpreters uh, were the regular interpreters every week, but they would take turns uh, each week. The, so um, one interpreter would go, then the next week the other would go. Uh, one of the interpreters was from West Texas. I don't know if um, you know people from West Texas, but they are very uh, relaxed and uh, take things very uh, easy, okay? And uh, they also talk very slowly. And the other interpreter is from New York City. And I don't know if you know any people from New York City, but they all talk very fast. So I noticed that um, the first interpreter from Texas would come out and the doctor would change the medication. When the next interpreter would come from New York City, the medication was changed again. So I uh, was being a little presumptuous, but um, what do I have to lose? A few days in, what are you gonna do, fire me? So I said, um, are you treating the deaf girl or are you treating the interpreters? And the doctor said, he was a good one. He had, he was, he had an open mind and it, and it sort of blew his mind. So he took the girl off of all the medication. And from that point on, she was stable. Okay. And so that began my interest in, um, clinical services and how we provide clinical services to deaf people. So the next few minutes, I want to talk about some of those things. The issues are on the slide. I'm not going to um, go through each portion, but I want you to remember this for later. It's important information. Okay. This whole issue regarding uh, deaf mental health uh, care is very important uh, that, we, that we deal with this. Hearing people uh, don't even know that it's a thing. Crisis care is, very, is, is, is more complicated for deaf people. It's two out of a thousand people are deaf and use visual communication. I'm not talking about hard of hearing people, they have issues and I don't mean to ignore that community, but I'm speaking only about, mainly about deaf people, people who use American Sign Language as a mode of communication. And that group relies heavily on their eyes for communication access, not their ears. And uh, Zoom, Oftentimes, uh, many people use their ears to navigate and take in information. But for someone who's deaf, it's a huge issue. And um, we were just having some issues before we started uh, my presentation. The, the interpreter's video is small for me. It's a thumbnail size, and it's hard for me to see. Uh, for us, it's not about ears. It's, it's about access to communication and language. Uh, when... Um, we reframe it from a, a broken uh, ears or the inability to hear to language access, then we can get the proper care to deaf people that they need. Uh, now, as I told you, I grew up deaf. My parents were hearing and they didn't use sign language. And like almost 93% of all deaf people grow up in homes where uh, the first language 
is, is, is their first language is not there. They grow up um, and cannot hear or speak. So they don't have access to language in their first language. 80% of uh, deaf children attend schools where they're linguistically isolated. Uh, so they're lucky to have uh, interpreting services often, but how is the interpreter helpful to a, a, a five or six year old uh, child who has no exposure to language? How does interpreting services help them? And uh, deaf children will experience high rates of um, misdiagnoses and inappropriate treatment by the mental health system and by parental neglect. And so- And physical and sexual abuse. And so when they experience some of the same frustrations that they grew up um, going to school and um, uh, with misdiagnosis and treatment. So my question is for you to ponder today, if you cannot effectively interact with a client or a patient, how can you provide treatment for them? Now we get to the uh, mental health system. They will experience the same frustrations that they've experienced all their life. When we talk about trauma-informed care, but as it applies to deaf people, it, it doesn't apply to deaf people because they're going to continue with the same old things that have failed them in the past. And as it comes to the crisis system in 988, Rarely do this crisis planning, the crisis planning team think about how they'll provide effective language communication or access to deaf clients. I know of almost no states that has invited the deaf community to participate, to come to the table at the initial stages of planning. Some places perhaps will invite a deaf person later after they've already started the plan and then realize they've made a mistake and then invite someone from the community. But you know, some states will realize, oh, we need to think about those poor deaf people and then bring in an interpreter on the team uh, and let us know what, what they need, let us know what we need to do. So that attitude is that hearing people know better and deaf people should just sit over in the corner and we'll take care of you. That's the kind of attitude, you know, but we have our own experiences. We have our own philosophy about how things should proceed and how things should go. Ask us. The hearing world in general has a lot of misconceptions. I'm not gonna read the whole slide for you, but it's there for your, your perusal, but um, if you leave this discussion with anything, leave with this, that most deaf people are not uh, embarrassed or, or are upset with being deaf, but we're, ups we're upset with being oppressed and uh, the hearing world not understanding us. How do most uh, hearing people, most hearing people in the system uh, plan to provide language access? They think, oh, I know, we'll, we'll just provide an interpreter, if you're lucky, okay? Sometimes they think, you know, let's find someone who can sign a little bit. And there's a huge difference between an interpreter, a qualified certified interpreter, and someone who can sign a little bit, a huge difference. But that's fine provide an interpreter, but understand there are some things that are going on. What's going on is um, what you're hearing is the interpreter. Lee, he's a good guy, he's my interpreter. I uh, worked with him yesterday, we went over some things uh, and he's, he's doing a very good job for you. But Lee's brain is not my brain. So you're gonna hear what Lee thinks I'm saying. You're not hearing it from me. 
deaf people who are watching me, they have this, they, they're getting my, my uh, message, but the hearing people are hearing what's coming from Lee. Okay, a few years ago, I was asked to join a huge pre-conference uh, lecture during the day. It was uh, a Dara over in the And at this conference, <coughs> there was maybe 200 people in the room and uh, three speakers. There was uh, Neil Glickman, hearing individual, Charlene Crump, deaf individual, and then me. And so the first two persons uh, had an interpreter, but they chose to speak and had the interpreter uh, interpreting for uh, the other two, and I signed for myself. Very quickly noticed uh, in the audience, uh, a strange thing happened. Those who were watching the signing were, were tracking my, my speech and laughing at my jokes. But the hearing audience who were, watch, who were listening to the interpreter, they were having the opposite effect. And I kept trying to figure out what was going on. And during the break, I came over to the interpreters and asked how things were going. And they said, well, um, everything is going swimmingly. Everything's going smoothly. But it, but it wasn't. Several people from the audience had come over to the interpreter team as well and saying, do, do you need help or do you need to call back up? No, we're just fine. Everything's fine. My point is the people who were watching me sign saw one presentation and the people who were listening to the interpreters, they heard another presentation. So many times, you read a transcript of the talk and I'll be looking through it and go, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And so now, why am I bringing this up? Think about a 988 call. How will the, tell, the person on telephone contact you? What is the default? Calling through an interpreter. Most of the time, you're using a relay interpreter. Why? Because there's no plan in place. You don't have a specific or a specialty path for a deaf person to contact a qualified individual who can interpret uh, directly and clearly for them. So how do we reduce this problem? Well, we have to have a plan in place and ready to go. What does that involve? We need to think about how we can best provide effective communication without over-relying on interpreters. I'll be honest with you, the deaf community is small and in most states, you'll have them uh, a large uh, concentration of them um, <clears throat> where the call center is located as well. And I'm gonna to touch on that uh, a little bit more in a minute but I wanted to bring that up. The plan needs to include how to respond to a deaf person calling in. A call today will involve relay services who will often uh, hang up. They may think I'm a scammer or selling something. Where are they going to refer, refer me to? If you tell me that, well, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. That depression. I need a counselor who signs. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to do. That's not a response. That's not an acceptable response for a person in crisis. 
I realize my time is running out, so I'm gonna move through this here a little quickly. But I wanna emphasize a few points, effective ways of providing communication services for a deaf person with mental illness in crisis, to find someone who can sign directly, communicate directly with them. When we can't do that locally, can we do that nationally, at a national level? I want to have a discussion uh, regarding 988 at a national level for a call center for deaf clients. We know that can work because. Vibrant. Vibrant. has a disaster helpline already in place nationally, ready to go, but it's not set up to accept mental health crisis calls. We need something like that in place. Second, do not rely on relay services. If you must use an interpreter, have a contracted interpreter ready to go on call who shows up, who can effectively interpret for mental health settings. That means that the interpreter themselves are mental health trained. My time is almost out. A few things I want you to remember is that I'm a deaf person, but deaf people, uh, we are deaf, we're not disabled. We use uh, sign language as our main mode of communication. If you leave with that alone, then the, my speech has been, has been successful. Nothing about us without us is the other thing. Go to the deaf community, ask them for input and feedback. Sun Tzu. Chinese philosopher said, go to the people, listen to the people, learn from them. That is what I encourage you to do. Third, as you develop a system, think about how the call will be routed or go through. Think about how, how, how we don't, uh, re-traumatize deaf people in the process and don't accept the status quo. We've had the status quo up until now. Help us to support National 988 Call Center. Help us to support uh, culturally linguistic services instead of the status quo. Thank you for your time. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Please reach out to me. Steve, thank you so much. This is, has been uh, <clears throat> such an important topic <clears throat> and given us so much to think about. Um, and, uh, and also, Lee, thank you so much for, uh, for interpreting. Um, very quickly, Megan, um, it, as far as the roundtable discussion, any, any thoughts, any questions? Uh, brief thoughts you have just based on what you've heard. Oh God. I want to thank Steve so much for this information. Uh, there are so many comments in the chat box saying how important this information is and it is. I also want to note that Steve has led a mental health interpreter training every year. He really started it with his team and I uh, wanna emphasize that point, how important it is to have a mental health interpreter on call um, at your crisis centers uh, to, to get some of the best communication. Of course, direct services are best, which is a clinician who can, uh, is ASL fluent. Uh, if not, a mental health interpreter is good, but it, 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 the point is to also train clinicians to also work with interpreters if interpreters are there. Uh, people who come into um, 
crisis are at their most vulnerable and to be relying on an interpreter to speak for them and they don't even know the interpreter, the interpreter doesn't know them, it's awfully uh, vulnerable. So I just wanna put that out there. Absolutely. And I, and I will tell you based on this, uh, having heard this presentation, we will be, I'll be circling back with our planning committee in North Carolina to make sure that we are including the voice of, of deaf and hard of hearing in our, in our planning for 988. So we are at time, uh, just very quickly, I don't know if Richard McKeon or Brian Hepburn are with us for any closing remarks. Uh, Brian Hepburn is down in New Orleans, and so I was ah. those closing remarks. <laughs> Hi, this is this is Richard McKean. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, so uh, well, I just want to thank everybody for the presentations today. I mean, I think uh, a number of really critical issues have been brought forward for our uh, uh, consideration um, moving forward, one being the the importance of substance abuse. Um, and substance abuse crises. We know that somewhere between uh, 25 and 40% of all suicides and sui or suicide attempts uh, are done involving some kind of substance, alcohol or drugs. Um, so that is, that is hugely important. And, and also the presentation we just heard um, regarding um, you know, access uh, for those who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we actually have been doing some work with the Disaster Distress Helpline as a model to look to see the extent to which it can be um, uh, um, adapted for the lifeline as a whole. So very important. So thank you so much for the presentations. Absolutely, thank you. And I did see in the chat, someone uh, asked if we could have interpreters at every, uh, at every one of these. Crisis Jam, but I think that is an excellent idea. Uh, so we are out of time. Thank you so much. It has been my pleasure to be your host today. And um, again, uh, in, in, and I will end with a quote again from the late great Don Cornelius, wishing you all love, peace, and soul. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>